as Chris said a moment ago, we uh, have been practicing for quite a while and we're fortunate enough to be invited into the RMIT scene and to have our work kind of scrutinized and be encouraged to better understand our own working practices. And so this term on the screen um, is a term that was introduced to us by some of the people at RMIT and it's a term that was originally, uh, is originally attributed to the literary critic I.A. Richards and what he said was that what is sought in any creative work is a kind of specificity that surprises because otherwise what is summoned up in an audience is a kind of a stock response, uh, boredom if you like. And he goes on to cite a, um, a poem in which the reader of the poem, it's a D.H. Lawrence poem, the, the reader is put in, into this unlikely position of being beneath an enormous building from the ceiling of which emanates massive booming sounds. And then as the reader reads more, it becomes apparent that this is not actually what it seems. It's actually the recollection of being a small child playing underneath a grand piano. And so this fantastic kind of literary moment, the reader is more or less transported in time and space, so transported in time from being an adult reading a poem back to childhood and back to adulthood and in space, sitting in a chair, entering the space of some unusual building with massive sounds and then in, into the space beneath the piano and then back out into the real world of the, of the reader. And I think the architectural implications of this term and this sort of story are quite palpable, particularly when you see an image like this. So this is a street in Chicago um, with a leg of a grand piano. So fantastic to contemplate a grand piano at the scale of a city and sounds that a piano might make at the scale of a city or a city that's sitting underneath a real size grand piano or a miniature city. So a lot of our work is built up around ideas such as this and all. today what we want to do for an hour is talk about 10 projects for hopefully six minutes each, um, starting with this one. So, I think there's probably nothing more ordinary than a common brick. Um, bricks are to brick veneer, what brick veneer is to urban sprawl. There's quite a lot of stigma attached to ordinary bricks. Yet, when you isolate a brick out and start thinking about it, its uh, character and its uh, poetic potentials you can literally sort of open up a brick, metaphorically and literally, to other possibilities. <coughs> So this is a project we did for University of Queensland. It's a laboratory project uh, in which we took, took bricks. Many of them are laid traditionally, um, but quite a number of them are hand cut with a bolster to turn the split face outward. And we used a couple of different brick types to achieve this, um, this feeling. So one of the ideas running the project was that the interior is a, a sterile, physically contained laboratory environment <coughs> and the outside sits in the real world, the, the sort of, uh, the, the, world, the dirty world of subjectivity. So we wanted this, the outside to feel like a handmade clay pot and the inside like a counterpoint to the interior. This uh, outcome was actually layered with some of the thinking from one of the guys in our office called Ashley Payne who'd been doing a series of self-portraits. So the image on the left of the screen is uh, one of the original line diagrams. They refer to self-portraits. They're clearly not uh, literal, literally portraits, but they're indelibly Ashley's own kind of line drawings. And then what Ashley would do is put these drawings through a series of processes, of, through um, contemporary processes of pixelation or printing processes and then he'd see what the impact of these processes was on the original line works. So as a, as a test case, this is a very old project in our, in our practice, we thought it would be very interesting to see what the implication would be of the brickworking trade upon the original line work. So we quite literally then just translated some of that artwork into, into brickwork. And contrary to um, popular opinion, this wasn't some sort of random brick smashing fest. It was actually a very precise, disciplined um, exercise. Every single brick 
cut was known, every other half of the brick placement was known, and you can see here the, the technical drawings that um, were prepared in preparation for the construction. These are the, the brick types, so we found two bricks that were fantastic together, uh, both in isolation really quite ordinary, but together um, provided a fantastic richness. And importantly, the centre of each of these bricks is different. They're extruded, their extrusion process is different. So you can see the brick on the far right having the large central hole and the bricks on the left having the, the smaller central holes. And then there are two, two brick cut types, one edge cut, and from that you get two, two kind of uh, conditions. You have a very smooth face and a very, very craggy face. And so then what we set about was figuring out how to begin to lay these bricks to make a, a very, very rich uh, brick building. And the reason for this was that this building was to sit into a very, very prosaic um, institutional environment. So what we were interested in doing was, introdu was to introduce uh, a rich textured counterpoint to this otherwise dreary, drab uh, brick environment so the entire precinct could um, lift itself. Here's the brickies standing around wondering what they've got themselves into. Um, and interestingly, we went through, I think, two bricklayers arrived and then went away again. And the third bricklayer was a man who came out of retirement um, who thought this was a, a fantastic thing to get involved with. One of the other things that our office really enjoys doing is taking very, very ordinary things. So here's an example of an ordinary brick and starting to study what an ordinary brick can yield. But it's also an ordinary system. So the most ordinary system probably in, in Queensland is brick veneer construction. So this is stock standard brick veneer construction. And then to be quite faithful to that system, to not think of bricks as heavy, heavy things, but to be faithful to the idea of a brick as a veneer. And so this is like a fragile shell that uh, sits around the outside of this building. One of the other things we're really quite quite fond of is um, displaced objects. So there are lots of instances when you walk around uh, houses, public realm, where you see things which, if you think long and hard enough about it, take on different characters. And when this happens, I mean, it's it's this this reeks of any number of things from some sort of wonderful DIY inventiveness, some sort of wonderful poetic, like has this, is this table, has this man owned this table forever and he actually gets to where he's going and dismantles it and uses that as, as a table again. Um, is it actually a boat um, that became a table and now it's being used as a boat again, who knows? Uh, so the sort of hybridization is in many ways fascinating and we, as a practice, are always on the lookout for some of these things because the resonance that exists between physical objects uh, can, be, can be used uh, in, in interesting ways. This is a project we did, again, for the University of Queensland in one of the rooms in their complex of great court buildings, which is the sandstone kind of centre of the university. Our brief for this was to take this tiered lecture theatre and uh, gut it, basically remove all of the tiered flooring, uh, turn it into a flat floor multifunction multi uh, lecture theatre, take down the old blue curtains and put up new blue curtains, take down the old fluoro lights, put up new fluoro lights, um, and then choose loose uh, tables and chairs, much like this stuff from their standard range of laminate, uh, laminate stuff. This is a really interesting room to me because it isn't classifiably heritage. It's not, um, it's not everybody's cup of tea either. But there's something quite endearing about all of the furniture and fitments and things in this space. And yet it was destined for the mini skip. So when I was in there one day contemplating this quite forlorn idea of stripping the room out and binning it, this idea came to us that the desks themselves were almost exactly the same size and proportion as the windows. So we set upon this idea, you can see on the left of the screen the desk as a desk and on the right of the screen the desk as a curtain. So we found this uh, way then of enabling this idea 
to take over the entire project. So desks became curtains, uh, floor became desks, uh, the chairs became acoustic ceiling panels for their absorptive qualities. Uh, we then retained the old chalkboard. We uh, retained the old painted datum. We retained the old chains that held up the fluoro lights and so on. Now this wasn't really an exercise in um, recycling in terms of any green agenda or, or, or even uh, re recycling well for any other reason than through some sort of nostalgic sentimental quality because the room had this fantastic uh, lived in aged feeling so here you can see the outcome which is the floor, the hardwood floor is desk and the desks themselves used as curtains so they're, all of the desks sit on runners and they run around the room and so they're more like shutters than curtains actually and there's this vague, when you stand there in the room and survey the scene there's something vaguely familiar about these desks that are on the walls but it's still a little hard to quite imagine where they might have come from and in their open position the light that comes in from these windows glances across the surface of the desks and uh, there are decades and decades of wonderful graffiti some of which can't be said in this room um, but there's one here I don't know if you can read it there it says question everything this used to be a science lab and someone's responded under that why which is quite a, a fantastic uh, end observation to this project this um, dual sort of compliance and defiance so the word why is both compliant and defiant of the original statement and I think this is something that we come across as architects all the time is um, what we choose to comply with and what we choose to defy and sometimes it's fantastic in terms of navigating a path in architecture if you can do both simultaneously and here's an example <laughs> of just that these are the um, characters from the 60s TV show The Time Tunnel and obviously this space they're standing in is fictitious the ability to travel in time and space and if only we could figure out a way of, as architects of making this possible but it's fun and interesting sometimes to think of the building code of Australia implications on a, a room like this and um, the kind of escape provisions and so on um, often in our work what we com come up against particularly in refurbishment work is situations where things uh, building elements are just horrible and one of the classic cases of this is gun barrel corridors running down the center of institutional buildings so one of the things that we often resort to as architects is um, the kind of hyping or taking taking really prosaic things and hyping, the, hyping them to the extent that the reprehensible actually becomes humorous or fantastic somehow so whilst this is a um, there's a photo montage this isn't sometimes fic uh, reality is stranger than fiction this is um, a woman who works at the University of Queensland standing in this corridor uh, having her wedding photos taken and this is this is the reality so this is a corridor in the chemistry building and so quite straightforward we the, the gun barrel corridor was unavoidable and so what we did was painted and lined the wall ceiling with concentric lines to make this a really fantastic kind of optically engaging environment to be in you can see in the distance the fire escape door is it painted with concentric rectangles as well to uh, extend the perception of space through the escape door and out the other side and I think quite interestingly what happens when you stand dead center the perspective the perspective is true and then when you move off center space appears to bend at the location of the doorway you can see littered along the length of the doorway you get glimpses into these laboratory spaces you can see the, the flasks and so on, on on the left of that one office space uh, in these kind of environments so this is quite common in our in our practices work is to try to instill things with some sense of humor something highly visually engaging um, something where people get out of a lift and really 
really love walking down that corridor for some reason or other. Some of you, I don't know, maybe the particular year I took for a tour of girls' grammar school are no longer here, Chris. I can't, oh yes, a few people. Uh, a lot of the work that we do also tries to be um, open to broad interpretation. So this is, this is the west wall of Brisbane Girls' Grammar School Creative Learning Centre. And we've been asked, so that's a six-storey building. Uh, it's not a, a six-storey woman. It's a six-storey building with a woman photo montaged into the front of it. Quite coincidentally, at the time the building was built, this appeared in the David Jones catalogue. Um, and we've been asked a lot of times how this facade came to be. Is it based on pop art? Is it based on some fascination with... Uh, fabrics, is it um, based on some, we've even been asked if it, there's any indigenous connotations behind some of the patination in this wall. And in fact, it's none of the above. The, the, way this, the way this pattern came to be was because we were quite obsessed with the context of this project being the context of movement. What we look for frequently is situations in projects where we move past a physical context, so we might move past the fact that it's on a highway or surrounded with concrete to the fact that it's a context of movement, people in motion. So what, we're, what we were then led to was an idea of uh, being, then being obsessed with moiré, moiré being interference pattern, so two layers of material which appear to move but only because the viewer is moving. So this is another optical kind of uh, optical idea. So this is the context of the project. Uh, Brisbane Grammar School adjacent, so these boys running around at lunchtime playing football, soccer and whatever. People in motion experiencing this sort of pulsating uh, facade and also the inner city bypass. People at 80 kilometres per hour for about an eight second stretch um, who get the experience of this building that has this pulsating quality. So this was just simply trying to address the public realm in an engaging way and also trying to understand how you might build a six storey high, 50, approximately 50 metre long facade that is the same all over but is, an, is a highly engaging kind of outcome for those people around it. We've had a lot of people confused about what makes this work uh, in, in terms of we've, we've been asked where the motors are kept and where the, whether it's solar powered, that kind of thing. Um, most of our work is cheap, uh, quite cheap. This is actually the, the reality of that wall is a fibro inner surface painted with black and white stripes and an aluminium sunscreen um, with gaps. And it's the ever so slightly offset angle between the sunscreen and the painted stripes of the inner wall that cause the interference pattern. Um, now this isn't a screen and a, and a fibro wall for the sake of having a screen and a fibro wall. This is a west facing screen, so having a lightweight wall with a sunshade outside of it, outside of it in our climate is an absolute necessity. So once those pragmatics were already established, then how you go about detailing a wall and a screen beyond it were, became the, the main agenda. So this highly repetitive, uh, highly kind of op engaging, optically engaging outcome was a reasonably economical thing to achieve. That's only half of the building. This is the building, so it's, it's a six storey high usable space with two storeys of basement parking underneath it. And you can see the way that it nests itself into the site. You can see the, the diagonal line that runs through the building is a response to the heritage listed main building uh, on the left of screen. Now the, the heritage listed main building is this wonderfully symmetrical formal uh, building of the late 1800s. And what we were interested in doing is again not thinking necessarily about the physical context of the main building and the axis of symmetry as a, an axis that describes physicality, but
but it as an axis that describes choreographed people movement. So people walking through the front door of the school, school building and out the back door of the school building right on this um, axis of symmetry. And so that diagonal line that you see running through is actually uh, right on that passage through the building. So when you actually drop down into the school, you see the structure of the building gathered up into this uh, colonnade. And so this is quite literally a day in the life, people walking the bridge out, out to this building on a daily basis. Um, once you get across the bridge, this is a mashup between uh, an Escher drawing and the reality of what this space is actually like. We, in, in thinking about how to, how to design the social spaces of this building, what we were mostly interested in was facilitating very, very direct um, movement and very, very direct socialisation and movement between places, as well as high levels of visual connectivity. And the reason for this is the spaces you see in the background, they're the spaces for relatively structured learning. And this was really trying to be the counterpoint to that. So moving between structured learning and social or unstructured learning quite fluidly. And in this particular case, what this Escher-like or ant colony or Hogwarts-like outcome was really the result of tracing these uh, lines of least resistance three-dimensionally through space, so connecting balcony to balcony um, and so on. So we'd put stairs literally where they were most useful to keep people out of lifts. Now what happens, I think, what the other, the other point to this was to try to build a really memorable three-dimensional environment which captures the imaginations of its occupants. And um, you just have to bear with me, not Hall and Oates isn't everybody's cup of tea, but um, this... Um, The students were allowed to make their own DVD for the 135th, 135th anniversary birthday of the school. And this is a fragment from the DVD they made. And um, you'll have to just bear with the music till the end because there's actually a point to this. But really this, this DVD is just trying to illustrate how these students have really come to own this three-dimensional matrix of space and, uh, and have, have really done some wonderful things in it. So they choreographed this whole thing themselves. I guess what that, what that DVD is really trying to illustrate is something to do with how we work frequently is to try to be very, very pragmatic in the first instance to do with how you connect things and how you might thread people through space, but know reasonably well how this might unfold in a more poetic kind of fashion and, and enable other people to then start owning the space and, and working with it in their own way. Um, this, this next uh, project, some of you might know of the Tree of Knowledge, uh, which is a tree in Barcaldon, which holds great significance in the political and social history of Australia. It's nationally heritage listed. And it's said to be, well, I think it is the birthplace of the Australian Labor Party. And uh, someone poisoned it. and. <laughs> So then what happened was the tree was decaying and uh, got to a point where the tree really, something needed to be done with the tree before it didn't exist at all any longer. So a conservation management plan was written, a very weighty document to try to figure out how to, how to hold this tree, how, you know, how, how to meaningfully um, enable people to re-engage with this tree as a sort of a central, a central part of Australia's political and cultural history. There's something very interesting about 
when sinister things happen, like someone poisoning a tree and it, and it dies, and how you might then go about uh, remembering it. So what this image is is trying to show is the kind of the kind of ghostly, a ghostly remain or a veiled a veiled ghost, but a veiled ghost sitting within a a, a darkened kind of coffin-like sarcophagus. And we thought it'd be fantastic if within the confines or within the opportunities that existed in the conservation management plan that we were able to return the ghost of this tree back to the main street of Bark Alden. So you can see the way that this, uh, this happened through the construction of a, st a structure which deals up a lot of, a lot of issues. The, it, it was to protect the re remains of the tree from UV and from uh, rain. The, the remains of the tree was also taken by the um, CSIRO and dipped in some hideous concoction of chemicals so that the remaining pieces of bark and timber wouldn't decay anymore. But what we really wanted this to feel like is from the outside for the the sarcophagus or the coffin to have some sobriety about it through which you might see the ghost of the canopy of this tree. So this, this isn't a photo montage, this is a very, very grainy uh, photograph. So you can just glimpse through this the hint of the canopy that was. And the way that we, the way that we um, understood the canopy was by getting her old heritage photographs and we digitised these photographs and we be began to understand the significant kind of tree, uh, the, the significant branches and the significant kind of outcrops of leaves on the, on the top of the canopy. And from that we then were able to three-dimensionally understand the extents of the canopy. So from the outside you're sort of reading the extents of the canopy um, and at different times of the day, this sort of ghostly quality is, is um, evident to different extents. But then when you walk in underneath this canopy, the, the sort of um, the impression of the canopy is there for all to see. And it's made through the suspension of, I think there's 3,600 timbers of about that size that suspend down to the height of the original canopy. And the ends of these square timbers is cut on a diagonal at quite a shallow angle so, uh, so as to make the cut end uh, a diamond shape. And then they're painted a range of different kind of eucalypt colors. And, and at different times of the day and night, it takes on hugely different qualities. But one of the other um, interesting things I think a lot of what we try and work with is things in motion. So, sorry to wake you all up. Because these sticks are suspended, when the, when the wind blows through the structure, not only do the timbers move around like limbs, but they fracture the light that lands on the on the forecourt beneath it so the dappled light has a sort of a, a motile sense. Um, it's not quite as abrupt or extreme in real life, it's quite a gentle kind of overhead movement in, in, the, uh, in the wind. Not everyone was as pleased as we were with the, um, the outcome, the good old Courier Mail having their chop at uh, taxpayers money going up the creek. But the city council, uh, were the, the, the mayor in particular, stubby holders, placemats, postcards, tea towels and t-shirts, um, if anyone's out that way. Um, this is a, I don't know who knows Brisbane very well, but this is the Red Hill Skate Arena. And it's quite close to where I live in, um, in Brisbane. And on a daily basis, so drive past this building and there was a, a, development, a development application up on this site for the construction of multi-residential dwellings and during the process of that application which had been made complicated by the City Council I think almost to the point of rendering 
the application unfeasible or untenable. <coughs> this building was, bu was burnt to the ground <coughs> and then a man was subsequently convicted of arson over, over this act. And this has happened a lot in Brisbane's history. There was never a connection made between the arsonist and the developer, which is often the case. Um, and I'm not saying that there is a connection, but there a connection was never established. So there are heaps of buildings in Brisbane that have disappeared in similar ways. Um, some of them you'd know about. Cloudland, most fantastic um, live music and dance establishment, um, demolished to make way for residential units. Festival Hall, same thing. And my main interest in this is to do with buildings as facilitators of cultural continuity. So I think it'd be, imagine today if Cloudland still existed and uh, people were going to see concerts there that their grandparents went to see the Beatles in. I think that as a way of binding through generations, architecture that can enable binding through generations is, is incredibly powerful. So it kind of unnerves me when things are so sort of instantaneously taken away. Um, not that I'm a big um, roller skating fan, but I think it's wonderful to have these kinds of facilita facilities in our, in our suburbs. So I sit in the traffic with a sense of suspicion and anger, and it occurred to me one day that um, Skate Arena, quite, this is quite bizarre, Skate Arena is a, an anagram of arson attack, albeit not quite correctly spelt. And this really quite improbable discovery then prompted me to start thinking about other wonderful buildings in Brisbane that um, have been taken away. And here's some of the, not that the Victory Hotel has been taken away, but there was a fire in it. And I started wondering about the fire and whether it had any, any other connotations, but I, I don't think it did in the end. So I started wondering about these words and whether, whether or not some of these other words could describe something about how these buildings were um, taken away from our, our uh, cultural landscape. And, and some of these, these terms actually do hold particular significance to um, you know, the fact that the fe Festival Hall was removed because it was a fantastic site to build a tower. So the f feasibility study said it had to go. And Cloudland, the land value of that property is astonishingly high, you know, to build units up there with the city and river views, incredible. Uh, the Bellevue Hotel levelled under Joe's reign, um, it, and so on. So as, as I was having these thoughts, we were invited to participate in a, um, an exhibition at the Gallery of Modern Art called Optimism, and so what we proposed for this exhibition was a giant grave for dead buildings because we thought it would be really interesting to uh, contemplate well funerals when they're removed they don't, or buildings when they're removed they don't have funerals no one gets to mourn the loss of a building uh, and yet many people actually do so we imagine this uh, <coughs> massive headstone the kind of scale of headstone you'd expect a building to have and in this picture you see members of the Architectural Association dressed as buildings uh, going to the grave of dead buildings while buildings in the city of Brisbane look on wondering where, when their time is up I guess. So this grave that we built on one side of the grave we had the names of these um, these buildings that have been removed so from Festival Hall, Cloudland, Bellevue Hotel, Skate Arena and Victory Hotel then on the reverse side, this piece of blatant propaganda. So this was actually not just a, not just a uh, grave. This was intended to be a stage for the opening of optimism and the closing of optimism. And so what we wanted to do was make the backdrop to the stage, this piece of blatant propaganda, um, to make people sort of wonder why are, these, why are these strange words there, and then to go around the back side of the stage and then to start... Uh, asking questions about how some of these buildings come to be removed from our cultural landscape. 
So this is Dave McCormack from Custard doing his thing. Um, and there were a number of other fantastic live events in front of this, in front of this stage. Off, to this, off the edge, we had a, an area where people could pretend that they were writing to the family of the deceased in loving memory cards. So the family of the deceased being the city of Brisbane. And across the course of the exhibition, I think we collected some two or 3,000 of these cards. And some of them were fantastic. Um, some of them were really quite provocative. And what we discovered through this was that there's a... Um, it, it's, it's, never the, it's never the obvious stuff that people remember. It's often the things that fall in between the cracks. I don't know if anyone here remembers in the Maya Centre there was a roller coaster right up the top of the Maya Centre in Brisbane uh, that they removed. I don't know what they put in there. I think um, maybe uh, Lincraft or something equally inspiring. So this roller coaster that used to go around, people, we got dozens and dozens of cards lamenting the loss of the roller coaster because that's where particular people had their first pash or, you know, whatever it might have been. So it's these kind of things that resonate in people's memories about how they get around the city. And unfortunately, they fly under the radar of um, heritage conservation management. So it, it, there, there is no legislation protecting many of these buildings from removal, removal, and yet they hold a great place in people's hearts. So at the end of the exhibition, just like all of the buildings that it stood for, this thing was ceremonially sort of uh, ripped apart and binned. This is, this is a bridge. It's either a really little bridge or a really massive shoe, um, whichever way you want to think about it. So this is a project that we were commissioned for to connect the Yorongpili railway station to the Pat Rafter Tennis Centre on the right of screen. And we were brought into this process because they were, in a, they were in a desperate hurry. And what the state government had done is commissioned a group of engineers to design a bridge across the road. And the bridge was basically the br what you see at the bottom of the screen as, as a stock standard engineered solution to how you cross the road. But then another Another one of the departments within the government um, said, no, you can't, said to, the, said to the Department of Main Roads and Transport, no, you can't just build something so prosaic. You need to think about this as a burgeoning tennis community and this needs to inspire people, it needs to be a piece of placemaking, needs to do more than this. So then we were brought in to this seemingly uh, no-win situation to try to figure out how we could alter the course of this project. And the time frame was outrageously short. I think it, we were already in April and the bridge had to be built by the end of, by December of that same year. Uh, so from a cold start we had about seven or eight months. And so what what happened then was we were required to start attending design meetings on a weekly basis and we were expected to turn up with useful information. It's quite hard um, to understand, like take, take in all of the technical parameters, start understanding what, what does a burgeoning tennis community mean, uh, how might a bridge work in that kind of context. But nevertheless we had to turn up to meetings so one of the first things we started looking at was how this bridge approximated the proportion of a tennis net. And we started thinking about tennis nets and became quite obsessed with how beautiful the knots and the shadows and the distortions and things might be. And having some experience in the sort of optics of moiré and inter interference patterns started enjoying the fact that one side of the bridge might be lined with almost vertical lines and the other side of the bridge might be lined with waving horizontal lines and as you drive along and drop under it these kind of lines might move adjacent to one another similar to the way a net might might operate so i kept the troops entertained with all these 
schemes for quite a few weeks while well, we were still really coming to grips with um, a really good idea. We got obsessed with fairy yellow balls as well and started wondering whether or not we might <laughs> line both sides of this bridge with perforated yellow steel and again through moire create balls of different size. We then also started from our other work where we're just trying to deal with motile outcomes where things appear to be moving but nothing really is other than the viewer started enjoying the prospect of imagine driving down the road and seeing a ball that appears to be bouncing, a big furry ball that bounces across this bridge. Wouldn't that be absolutely fantastic? And so through a, a double layer of lining to each side of the bridge, we believed as you descend down below the, the bridge itself and your eye level descends through the slippage, apparent slippage of one plane upon the other, we could get this kind of outcome to occur. But the whole time we were doing this, we've, we were not completely certain in our own minds as to whether or not we were in the right realm. It felt a little bit too Tennessee, for want of a, an expression. And there's something fantastic about um, being more inclusive, I think, in design outcomes. So we started thinking about this unlikely, um, the unlikely marriage of the sole of the Dunlop Volley tennis shoe and the structural array of a, it's called a Warren truss, and how we were under some pressure to leave the structural design alone, so to leave the exact 45 degree um, structural arrangement of the webs of the truss precisely how they were. So this solution dealt up an outcome that was definitively tennis. It managed the engineering requirements and it also somehow more broadly plays into Australian culture because I think until reasonably recently, Dunlop volleys have flown under the radar since the 70s. Here's Yvonne Goulagong, or Goulagong Corley in her Dunlop volleys. They were the go-to shoe of the day. Um, and, uh, but since, since these days, Dunlop volleys have been taken over, as you know, by all manner of other um, or shoes for tennis, but they're still, they're still a shoe of choice for indie kids and roofing contractors and weekend fisher, fisher people and so on. So there's something really broadly culturally appealing about um, referencing a Dunlop volley in, into a project of this kind because it's not quite so sort of definitively professional tennis or, um, or just tennis for the sake of tennis. So then we began to un try to understand how we might be able to build this thing. And one of the most responsible ways, ecologically and uh, economically, was to build it out of fiberglass. And fiberglass also had the other advantage of having this fantastically rubbery kind of quality of rubber as an outcome. Um, so these, all of these shapes were basically fabricated by a boat builder. Um, up the north coast, and then basically just just clipped onto the um, onto the steel structure. One of the other one of the other parameters was that this bridge had to be trucked into place, lifted with a crane, and located overnight. So they closed Fairfield Road from midnight till 4 a.m. I think it was. So for, it had to be a four-hour install. So whatever we did had to. Uh, work within these incredibly incredibly prescribed kind of circumstances. So this is where they built it. They just built it in a great big field out the back of the builder's um, site sheds. And this is it going in. So Fairfield Road closed off and this bridge just literally quite um, heroically placed into position. And then the very next morning, trucks are just screaming along underneath it. Um, other s sort of serendipitous things, a lot of people think the Y stands for Yurong Pili, but it's the end of the word volley. Um, we're also then starting to wonder about 
on on match day the kind of fantastic uh, patriotism that happens how we might be able to begin to instill maybe the inside of the bridge with some uh, some sort of Australian coloration and so you can see we then lined the opposite side with these steel plates and this sort of bulbous quality where the where the V's turn these sort of puffy soft uh, elements that hopefully have some evocation of the interior of a, of a shoe like a Dunlop volley. Um, if you're anything like I was as a child you would have been fascinated by these thunder eggs. Um, I think what's fantastic about them is that the outside of them is so ordinary and um, unremarkable and then when you cut them open you find this incredible interior and I think again the architectural implications of an image like that are kind of palpable ordinary exteriors with m magical insides. They're a bit like Mesoamerican architecture uh, in the sense that these are they're tough kind of exteriors that fortress-like exteriors that hold these great greatly mysterious kind of darkened jewel-like insides. So when we were when we came across this quite bizarre relatively brutal uh, building at Nudgee College in Brisbane it started reminding us of some of these some of some of this early thinking had some resonance so this is a disused basketball court multifunction court that we were commissioned to turn into a, a theatre for uh, the drama department and multifunction theatre really but mainly the home for drama so what we were interested in is whether or not we could think of this building in those terms, like this fantastic kind of uh, ordinary shell that contains an absolute jewel on the inside. And through doing that, we hope that through reimagining the inside, people might then reappreciate the outside in the way that you might a thunder egg. Uh, because once you hold the whole object, including seeing the inside, you then start realising that the shell protects this inside. Um, and yet the inside of this thing was really nothing like a thunder egg. In fact, it was quite appalling. Um, there were leaks, there were white ants, uh, it was in dreadful repair. We're also interested in the typology of projects. So this is the, theater, the ceiling of the Capitol Theatre in Melbourne, Walter Burley Griffin Theatre. And the history of plaster work in uh, theatre buildings is quite well documented. So we're quite interested in how we might be able to um, not only work with the geometries of this bizarre building, but also how we might work with the typology of, of theatre interiors. Of course, you can't afford to build something like Walter Burley Griffin's wonderful ceiling even if you wanted to but we can afford to access these kinds of intriguing catalogues where you can buy things like keystones and um, other products very cheaply and these keystones which I think people have long forgotten the original use of a keystone structural use of a keystone as they happily glue them onto plasterboard um, we thought it'd be fantastic to buy thousands and thousands of keystones and decorate entire ceilings out of it in the same way that um, the ceilings of other theatre foyers work. So this is a redefined, this is the redefined entrance of that same building. We're also interested in the Griffin's theatre model as this sort of otherworldly experience. So this is the ceiling of it and the kind of crystalline looking to the heavens, uh, starry night sky sensibility. And I think the thunder egg qualities of this are also evident. This is cross-section of our building, what we were interested in, interested in was to take the buttress alignment on the right and left and array it through the building. So you can see all those triangles, the, the diagonal lines that are running through the centre of the building. So we were trying to, re at every moment we possibly could, reinforce this bizarre geometry of this building through the interior so that through reimagining the interior people might reappreciate the exterior, exterior of the building. So we came up with this idea that we could line these two flanking walls of the main auditorium space in a, a, a kind of a kaleidoscopic facade. So what you're seeing here is 
two mock-ups, one is to one mock-ups, and the, all of the black is just laminate, and then the surface, the surface that, I'll see if this, yes, this is mirror, that's a post-it note, <laughs> stuck on top of another piece of laminate, so you can see here, square on, it's probably easy to understand, the, that is some 300 millimetres behind this plane, and these are post-it notes stuck on the background. So then when you turn oblique to view, what you start seeing in these mirrored surfaces is these shapes repeated through space. So we, we had about that much space on each side of the theatre to play with. Not enough for one more row of seats, um, but too much just to build into a wall cavity. So this was... Um, the, we, this, this, it's this sort of 300 and something millimetre dimension that we decided to line with triangles of mirror on the perpendicular surface. So then we started ex basically experimenting to see what, um, what we might be able to inlay into this, into this surface. And what we ended up with was an outcome of one, two, three, four diamonds of different sizes. And the reason that we preferred diamonds was because when they array, they turn into these sort of wonderful starbursts. And these diamonds are pieces of phosphorescent laminate stuck onto a black laminate background. So again, we're talking about reasonably cheap materials here. And each of these pieces of phosphorescent laminate are drilled with a hole and one fibre of fibre optic pokes through it. So these appear to be uh, just gently, sometimes gently illuminated little diamonds of phosphorescence. This is the theatre interior looking square onto it. So you can see in the background that you're looking pretty much square on at those diamond, diamond shapes on stage looking back up. Now, when, when you get, when you approach the stairs to walk up and you're quite oblique to the facade is when you start understanding or it's actually quite difficult to, to understand what is what. Sometimes it looks like those dark black triangles are behind the outer surface. It looks like the, lit, the illuminated surface is in the foreground and the black surface is in the background. Other times I know, it, I know the geometry of this intimately and I can still trick myself into thinking uh, that things are in reverse. But only one-fifth of the diamonds that you see in that image are real. The rest are reflections in, the, in this sort of kaleidoscopic thing. Um, part of the reason for doing this was because we're trying to engage adolescent young men in, uh, in drama and in theatre and so this was thought to be a really interesting way of, of getting them thinking about lighting and sound and mo creating mood and so on. So this whole facade is able to be lit in, in a multitude of different ways. These, this lighting is actually T taking a light from the centre of the theatre and filling up these, just blasting the light, blasting the facade with purple light, and so these triangular spaces capture the light and reflect it through the, the three surrounding surfaces. Um, when you turn all the lights off, when the when the show starts, this is the facade with phosphorescence, pure phosphorescence, just glowing in space, and if you ever used to looking at your watch in the dark or whatever, you'll know that when you look, if it's, you see more when you see it in your peripheral vision than when you look directly at phosphorescent light. So the thinking was that as people sit and watch the show, these two facades would gently glow in their peripheral vision um, and then the sort of stage show commences and, and it takes over the, the interest of the facades. Some of this thinking was taken to the bathrooms uh, and then after all, all of that happened the client was excited enough to then go and reinvent the exterior of the building. Um, I know I've probably just about run out of time. I thought I'd just quickly show you two last things. This is um, the competition scheme we did for Bond University Architecture School and so we received the brief for this project and some of the things we were most intrigued with. Firstly, we were intrigued by the foundation buildings. I think this is probably the most marketed image of the university. 
and this the foundation buildings of the campus are designed by an architect called Arata Isazaki and his work at this particular in this particular phase was mainly obsessed with um, the idea of ruins and ruinous conditions and the ruins as a metaphor for change in a way so ruins as uh, representations of the past they exist in the present and they might also inform something about how the future might unfold so you can I don't know about you but I could after reading about Isazaki's thinking at the time of the construction of these buildings I was had a deeper appreciation of what I, could, I, I felt about the Bond University buildings so part of our thinking about how to build a new building here was to absolutely take some of that thinking into consideration. So the idea of ruins as a metaphor for change. And one of the second things that uh, we were interested in was in the brief, it, the brief called up a forum um, and a forum for exchange. So exchange between students, students and teachers, members of the general public, this fantastic place where all manner of things could unfold. The third thing that the brief called for was um, the sort of equality between um, workshop and um, studio. So the coexistence of paper and drills, hammers, shovels, pencils. So people getting getting right into how to, how to build things one to one, um, getting their hands dirty, but then simultaneously thinking about the history of architecture, the discipline of architectural thinking, and so on and so on. I think that is a really brilliant model for an architecture school and something we wanted to absolutely um, get right in ours. So then this is this happens in some of our work. Two two lines of thought came into one piece of thinking which was that perhaps the thing that most um, aptly accommodates this is the archaeological dig site typology. So this wonderful overarching roof that lets a beautiful quality of light through and under which people discover culture, people discover um, things about history. There is shovels and shovels and paintbrushes and drawings and textbooks and things all coexisting under this one overarching, in this one overarching space. And furthermore, what happens in an archaeological dig site is everything happens with utmost care and precision. So the kind of uh, learning about culture and so on, um, it, there's, a, there's a precision about it which is, I guess, understood. Then the last thing was we, that we felt the presence of students, um, it's one thing to have a, a community of design or a community of architecture, but the cornerstone of any community is the individual, I think. And so to provide students with their own place within some sort of scaffolded network so that uh, students might be given their own little cube of space to call home for their time at the university. Um, so unfortunately we didn't win, um, but it's good to see good to see a building coming along. Um, now this is the last thing I'll show you very, very quickly because I know we're out of time. This is, um, this is our office building, so it hopefully gives you one last impression of how we work. This is um, obviously a, a tradesman working, working his trade. He's stitching carpet um, strung up on a, on a beam. And this is the building in which he's doing it. This is the old Normanby carpet building. And for those of you who, who know Brisbane, it sits on the massive Normanby five-way intersection. Um, and it's was an incredible sort of um, complex arrangement of rolls of carpet, lino. I don't think the place had been cleaned since the 1960s. Um, there were skeletons of all kinds of marsupials found in roof spaces. Um, incredible, incredible place. And prior to it being the Norman B. Carpets building, it was a car showroom, and prior to that it was a curbside petrol station. And part of our ad admiration for the building actually lies in just how how kind of uh, useful the building's been to Brisbane. So to think that it's had five, four or five 
quite different uses over time and been relatively unchanged speaks volumes of its robustness and its flexibility and adaptability. Also fantastic kind of um, simplicity. This is white collar off, off the main road. So that's where you went in to buy your carpet. And off the back road, this is where all the blue collar stuff happened. All the carpets were delivered, stitched up, chopped up and dispatched. And almost never the twain should meet. The, there was a narrow staircase where and a back, back entrance to the white collar world where a worker would go down and ask a question or someone would come up, but you never really saw the two coming together. This is a, I really like this photo because it just shows what a mess buildings become over time. I don't know how many different building materials you can count there, but um, they're not all good. And a lot of them had, a lot of them had to be removed to make way for um, sound construction. Um, but there's a lot of really, uh, really good stuff in the building. Fantastic relationship with the city of Brisbane as well. Um, this is probably the most telling drawing as to how we work. We all sit at three foot wide benches, um, no upstands. So every bench is kind of like a meeting table. You can go and sit yourself down across from anyone. There's no distinction between a receptionist or an architect. We all just sit together in that main central space. And it was surprising to us just how similar to a carpet workshop our architectural firm is because we work on the same workshop floor they worked on. We, our kitchen's almost in the same spot as their kitchen. We sit around where they sat around. Um, so on the left of the screen, that's our meeting room. We work in the middle and we eat lunch on the right. And there are no walls at all, except if you want to go to the toilet. So we embarked on this very careful refurbishment process after the Normanby carpet. Um, building left, uh, the Normanby carpet business left. And, um, and have only just, we've only been there for about seven months now, but it's feeling like home. We, all of these incredible little traces of time, we've been very careful to leave behind. Um, this is a fantastic image in one shot alone. There's fluoro paint, black paint, brown paint, white paint, white PVC, gray PVC, red brick, blue chalk, Grey, grey mortar, there's black Nico pen, there's a PVC plug. I think I counted 26 different materials in one spot. And as you move closer and closer in, it just gets better and better, right up to the point of, you know, the, the smallest of idiosyncrasies. Now, these are not the sort of things that architects do. This is, the, this is what happens, I think, in the sort of DIY commercial workaday world where people are not so obsessed with how to make beautiful signs, how to make um, architectural space. This is a hard working building and what I really love about it is the fact that the, this building has kind of authentic scars of time, uh, the sort of stuff you can't design but, and the sort of stuff you'd never ever want to get rid of either. Um, so we've moved in and we've pretty much left all of this as it was. We've not cleaned, not cleaned much, only the ne necessary. We've embarked on this process of really trying to just recycle a bit like that theatre, the uh, lecture theatre I showed you an hour ago or so, where we've recycled a lot of what we found on the inside back into itself. So this is now the entrance to our studio on the top floor. Um, and we work under this wonderful kind of roofscape in a very open, in a very open plan. Um, look, the only other thing I wanted to talk about today as I finish just showing you some of the images as to where we work, I was really impressed with, well, I guess it was Chris's initiative to, to hold a series based around the idea of discipline because I think discipline is a relatively underutilised term and I've been talking to you today mainly about um, ideas, how you turn ideas into buildings. And I kind of did that intentionally because I, firstly, I've never spoken here before, so I thought it was good to give you guys a, a relatively brief snapshot of a whole lot of different projects. But I was also having had some experience in talking to students or listening to students explain their own projects. I thought it might be useful for you to see how we go about coming up with ideas and then how those ideas are then converted into architectural outcomes. Because I think often it's the case that people might have 
ideas that are, amount only to rhetoric. There are no architectural implications. It's very hard to understand how you turn a great idea into a really decent architectural outcome. And if you think about our, the way that I've described our work, the specificity part is almost the discipline part. That's the bit where we're researching and reading and discussing and really finding out absolutely getting getting grips with what um, what the world is about such that we can then yield us some sort of surprise uh, out of those discoveries thank you everybody